I would like to thank the ISF for your continued investment into education and research and for your valued trust in working together with the AISTS since 2018. Our project manager in charge of this research, Mrs. Christy Dukhart, graduate from our Master in Sport, will now provide you with more details about the methodology we will follow for measuring the global economic impact of esports. Christy holds a Master of Science in Accounting and benefits from over 10 years experience in consulting at EY and PWC in the areas of audit and mergers, as well as in general accounting and financial analysis in the private sector. Up to you, Christy. Thank you, Claude, and good afternoon. As Dr. Stricker mentioned, my name is Christy Ducart, and I am the project manager for this research award granted by the IESF. My next few slides will provide you with an overview of the global economic impact of esports, as well as the value chain of the esports stakeholders we are looking into. According to a survey completed by PricewaterhouseCoopers in 2020, esports is the fastest growing category among all sports. The objectives of this research are to understand if this growth projection is accurate, will continue, and if the global esports industry is both sustainable and profitable for the key stakeholders. In order to accomplish this, we will look at the revenue and cost models of key stakeholders. We will then map out and analyze the value chain. And lastly, we will look at potential business models that could assist in ensuring sustainability and profitability for those stakeholders. According to a report issued by Deloitte, there are some critical issues for the sports industry to evaluate in 2021. The first item on that list is to reevaluate and redesign the business models, especially around revenue generation. This is because the traditional methods of revenue generation, such as ticketing, have been drastically impacted by the global pandemic. The esports industry is not as dependent on in-person fan attendance as traditional sports. However, the global market is seeing shifts in how the business is developing. Much like traditional sports, IP owners and professional players are the highest paid stakeholders. The question is, is there a business model where all stakeholders can maintain their business going forward and with a profit? Another critical item in the report issued by Deloitte is a call for sports organizations to redefine their relationship with fans. This is where esports has an opportunity to help leagues, teams, and athletes boost fan engagement. As an example, during the pandemic when sports came to a halt, an NBA team, the Phoenix Suns, simulated their regular season games on NBA 2K and streamed it live on Twitch. The debut stream had more than 221,000 viewers. This begs the question, is there a market for this? Given the shifts in the market due to the pandemic, as well as the shifts in the growing esport industry, it is important to reevaluate the current business model and to evaluate how the current shifts in the business will impact the industry. This information, along with the understanding of value generated by the various stakeholders, can be utilized to create a business model that would provide profitability and sustainability into the future for all stakeholders within the esport industry. The key research questions that will be investigated as part of this research are, who are the stakeholders in esports? What are the current revenues and costs for stakeholders? Is it as large as the media makes it out to be? How does the value chain flow? Where are there opportunities for revenue and growth for stakeholders? And lastly, where are opportunities for minimizing risk for stakeholders? To accomplish this research, there are four overall steps to the methodology. The first step will be to understand the esports industry. Who are the primary stakeholders? 
What regions drive esports, and where are their opportunities geographically? Lastly, what is the current business model? To accomplish this step, we will first collect financial data to build the revenue and cost models of the key stakeholders. We will also collect qualitative data to understand the strategy of the key stakeholders. The next step will be to understand the value chain. Who is involved? How do they provide value? And do they receive any value? This will help us to understand not just the financial side of the industry, but also to identify and understand the value each stakeholder is both creating and capturing. We can use this data to identify where there is opportunity for added value. Next, we will conduct a case study of some of the key stakeholders to evaluate what they do well and where there is room for improvement. This step will help us start identifying potential strategies that could facilitate sustainability and profitability for all stakeholders. Lastly, based on the research and data we have collected, we will propose a business model and recommendations that could assist in assuring a sustainable and profitable esports industry. As part of the methodology of understanding the industry, we'll, com we'll complete a SWOT analysis, starting by identifying the internal strengths and weaknesses of each key stakeholder. What do they do well? How can they be more effective? Identifying the strengths and weaknesses will be critical as these are factors that are within the control of the company and can be improved going forward. Then we will look at the external factors, the opportunities and threats, those things which impact the stakeholders that are not within their control. Organizations can prepare for these external factors if they can properly identify them. Completing this SWOT analysis will help us to better understand the position each stakeholder and help us to find a more effective way for stakeholders to position themselves in the market. In addition, we will also complete a value chain analysis study. To understand a stakeholder's position in the market, the linkages of interconnected activity between each stakeholder must be understood. This analysis will help us to better identify each stakeholder's competitive position. These different analyses will help us to formulate strategies to improve each key stakeholder's position in the industry going forward into the future. In 2021, it is estimated that the esports industry will generate more than $1 billion in revenues, up from $947 million US dollars in 2020. That represents a year-over-year -year growth of almost 15%. Of those anticipated revenues, it is estimated that 834 million US dollars will come from media rights and sponsorship alone. That represents just over 75% of the total revenues expected. The global games live streaming audience is expected to hit almost 729 million in 2021, a growth of 10% from 2020. These figures indicate tremendous growth supporting the earlier assertion that esports is the fastest growing category amongst all sports. So how is this represented geographically? And who are the stakeholders that are part of this growth? Historically, esports has grown much faster in the developed economies of North America and Western Europe. This was due to a more sophisticated IT infrastructure. Major esports games were also mostly played on a PC, which posed significant entry barriers for those living in developing markets. This is set to change as we are now reaching a point where smartphones are more accessible than ever. With the addition of controllers and paddles, they offer gaming experience that is on par with what PC gaming or console gaming provides. This presents major opportunities for Southeast Asia where mobile gaming dominates. Southeast Asia is seeing the fastest revenue growth in the global esports industry. Total revenues are expected to grow from 28.2 million US dollars in 2019 
up to 72 million US dollars in 2024. In terms of audience, the region is anticipating 42.5 million viewers by the end of 2021. A majority of these will come from the countries of Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. These countries are unique to the Southeast Asia region and that they are all mobile first when it comes to game preferences. After geography, we will also look at the key stakeholders identified in the esports industry. At this stage of our research, key stakeholders identified include players and influencers, including both pro and amateur players, game publishers, sponsors and advertisers, broadcasting platforms, teams, organizers, and of course, consumers. Other stakeholders we have identified include investors, federations, sports clubs, equipment suppliers, and educators such as coaches. To provide a few examples, we'll dive a bit into a bit more detail on two of these key stakeholders we've identified, as well as two of the other stakeholders identified. Over the last decade, esports has grown into an industry that rivals traditional sports. Companies have taken notice, and as a result, we see sponsorship and advertising taking on a vital role in the esports industry. While the pandemic did impact esports globally, it is the one industry that showed impressive resilience during the pandemic, especially when compared to other industries. Top esports sponsors were a big part of this, providing the cash needed to keep the esports economy going. At this point in our research, we have identified several companies who have become large sponsors in the global esports industry, including, but not limited to, Red Bull, Mountain Dew, BMW, Intel, Coca-Cola, FTX, and the U.S. Air Force. Esports teams have amassed giant value, with some of the top teams in the world having a brand value of $250 to $350 million. Base Clan, Team Liquid, Cloud9, Fnatic, and Team Envy are just a few of the top esports teams around the world. Teams generate value through winning tournaments, merchandise sales, and of course, sponsorships. Much like traditional sports teams, organizations spend a bulk of their earnings on salary, trying to recruit the best players. Also, like traditional sports teams, some esports teams are now hiring coaching staff, team managers, personal fitness trainers, and mental health coaches, all with the intention of supporting their teams and creating the best teams possible. As previously mentioned, esports is a potential effective way for sports clubs to not only engage more fans, but also as a potential way to generate revenue. Thus far in 2021, FIFA 21 is the most popular sport genre esports game. The game boasts over 17,000 players, more than 700 teams, as well as over 90 stadiums and more than 30 leagues that players can experience. UEFA Champions League, Premier League, and La Liga are just a few examples of competitions that gamers have access to. The future of sports clubs within the esports industry will need to be evaluated as part of the new business model to understand if it can be both profitable and sustainable for organizations going forward. Federations are also stakeholders playing an important role in the development of rules and regulations for the esports industry. They also govern doping within esports. The IESF specifically has a, mention to, has a mission to further esports on a global scale by working with national federations to grow the sport. With the global reach these federations have, it is important to factor them into, into the understanding of both the current and future esports industry. So how do all of these stakeholders fit together? That is what we will investigate as part of the research. 
We will explore whether or not each of these key stakeholders provides value, and if so, how. Do these key stakeholders capture value? If so, how and from who? Understanding the value chain will be essential for the team to develop a business model that is both sustainable and profitable for the industry. So what do we know about value and revenue chains at this point? Pro players and influencers attract fans to the team as well as to events. They are earning through various means, including salary from their team, personal sponsorships, and merchandise sales. Some players also stream their play on different platforms, such as YouTube, which could gain additional rev revenue for them if they generate enough views. Much like in traditional sports, they are the stars of the global esports industry. Game publishers or developers gain value through licensing, as well as through exposure of their game at various events. Historically, they earned their revenue through game sales, but with the market shifting towards free games via mobile apps, more and more of these developers are generating revenue through in-app purchases throughout the game. Broadcasting rights is another way in which game publishers can generate revenue. Sponsors are primarily driven to advertise to create brand awareness. They do this by advertising at events, as well as placing their logo wherever possible including uni on uniforms and on websites, for example. This value can come from broadcasting platforms, event organizers, teams, and the players themselves. Continuing on, broadcasting platforms such as Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube are responsible for how content is distributed within esports. These broadcasting platforms generate revenue through advertisements as well as through subscriptions from consumers. The primary responsibility and value they offer is a stable platform so that viewers can watch events uninterrupted. Teams, much like traditional sports teams, generate value through the players on their roster. Their primary means of earnings are through sponsorship, prize money, and merchandise sales. Last up are the organizers. This group gains value by the teams that compete in their events. They must generate a large enough audience to gain the attention of top teams and generate revenue from sponsorship. Production value and content, as well as the players and teams competing, are two critical factors that draw in consumers. By completing this research, skills in research and financial analysis will be developed. Strategic thinking skills will also be developed. Not only is it important to think strategically to develop a sustainable and profitable business model, but it will also be important to take into consideration and evaluate the risk of failure or changes based on government regulations as seen in China. Overall, we anticipate learning and sharing with the IASF a great deal about the esports industry. Thank you so much for attending our session. We look forward to a great collaboration with the IASF.